Hey guys, welcome to the show. We are broadcasting here inside of Big Al's Record Barn in San Jose, California, where it has been a beacon of light in the vinyl community for over 50 years. When they say they don't make them like they used to, I think they were talking about this place. It is amazing. I mean, look how many records are here. I am, I am overwhelmed, to be honest, guys. I don't even know where to begin. In fact, Big Al himself doesn't even know half of what he has here. So. Why don't we go talk to him? Let's go talk to Big Al. Let's let's find him in this place. Al. Al himself is a character. Uh, I think a lot of folks actually avoid going there because of him, and other folks go there just for him. Man, where could he be? The store's only 6,000 square feet. I guess he would be considered a curmudgeon. He almost looks like like a bad version of Frosty the Snow. <laughs> oh? I asked him if I could hear it, and he like barked at me. He's like, no, people will buy a record for $1,000. They don't need to listen to it. Hey, there you are. Come on. Oh, we found him. Hey, Al. Hey. How's it going? All right, how you doing? Good, good. I'm like, pull up the chair over here. Thanks so much. Fine. So, uh, tell me about when this store opened. Jesus. You know, I was talking to my old employee, and we can't remember when we opened up here. I don't remember when I opened up here. I really don't. I worked. Well, I used to be a carpenter, and I used to work on roofs, and I fell off three stories, and I was off work for about a year. And while I stayed home, my wife got a job working for a jukebox company. Her boss told her, I got a whole room of records back there. Get them out of here one way or the other. She told me about it and I said, well, bring them home and give me some, <laughs> something to do. So she brought home about 200,000 45s Ooh. and my garage was packed full and then started out in the San Jose flea market. It was there for five years. I figured if, if I can make it for two days, a a week there, I can certainly make it in a store seven days a week. So I moved into Santa Clara. I had my other store for 25 years and they closed it down and I was out of business for about six months. And then I bought this store from Rose Rare Records. He passed away and his wife sold me this store. First time I was there was a few years ago. I rode my bike into town and I stopped by Big L's and went in there with my two bags. And he just stopped me dead in my tracks and, and, and just said, I hope you don't think you're walking to my store with those bags in your hands. He totally thought I was gonna be a thief. So I, I, I looked around, got nervous for my bike and because it wasn't locked up too well, and then just split. I was like, I don't have time to do this right now. I know there's there a whole room in the back that I just looked and I was like, this is amazing, but I can't even find the light switch. And yet, I feel like this story is somewhat repeated by other people in that the first experience is always kind of rough and just weird and obnoxious and you, you go, ah, I'm never going back there, but then you're a record junkie and you have to go back. I don't know, you kind of get their game, which is like, I'm the grumpy old man. And they're actually kind of cool in this weird grumpy old man kind of yeah. way. I'd say if you were to judge quickly, yeah, he'd probably be considered like an angry guy, a curmudgeon. I've known him since I was a kid. Him and I like would kind of bat heads every once in a while, but he's just like any one of us. He's, he cares about what he does. He's, he's, a, he's a good guy. I wasn't always the best guy in the world. I've been married six times. I got nine children by different wives. <laughs> and I got nine grandchildren and to end up with a lot of friends and, and with a nice wife, married 38 years. Pretty nice. Where did you grow up? Pennsylvania. I came out here out of high school, went to the Marine Corps. Then I started boxing in the Marine Corps and I played football in the Marine Corps. And then when I got out of the Marine Corps, I was a heavyweight boxer in Los Angeles. Not very good. Then I tried to get in the pitcher business. I, I never could get in it. It was a really tough business. Do you think those kids today, growing up in a digital age, are they, will they appreciate vinyl? I'm getting to see a lot of young people in here, lots of young people, more and more all the time. And I've also had people bring their children in and say, look, that's a record player. <laughs> you know? well, I've seen people 
old as like maybe 70 going in that store to like at the youngest. I remember meeting this kid who was 14. You got a lot more people, not just like collectors come in. You got kids, you got people that sold their collections wanting to get their old records again. Like right now, I have customers that started with me the first day I was in the flea market that are still to this day buying records from me. It's hard to own a record store if you just like one kind of music. You have to pay the rent, you gotta pay the bills, you gotta sell a lot of records. So when I opened up my store, I opened up my model, something for everyone. I bought everything that was clean, no matter what it was. Kids records, comedy records, soundtracks, rockabilly records, and that's why my store is so good right now, because I have so many different kinds of things. He's got a lot of off the radar stuff. And it's not like they're like big money records, but they're just like cool records that if you're in a shop, you're gonna end up paying for them. But his place, 250, five bucks, it was just all day, any day. He's got a very big knowledge, especially when it comes to soul music. I, I got more records upstairs than I got downstairs. I got probably close to a million records so all together, LPs and 78s and 45s, probably close to a million. He's one of the only guys that's running a shop that style, you know, one of the only guys that has just like a big, basically a warehouse with some shelves where you can go and look and dig that way. I've been to stores all over the country and I've never experienced anything quite like Big Al's. You know? At certain points I found it overwhelming. That's why like the last few times I was going in there I was looking for specific things because I feel like if you just go in there to just be like, oh I'm just gonna go check this out, it's kind of like avalanche, too much going on. Um, it's not your average record store, it's a very unique interesting kind of place. You have to, you know, you have to go there with patience, you have to go there with uh, drive and motivation. You go in there when you have three hours to kill in the middle of the week and 50 bucks is burning a hole in your pocket. And you, just, you know, you spend some time going through the crates and going through the bins and seeing what he's got there. Do you have an album that means a lot to you? I got a lot of records that are autographed to me that mean a lot to me. I got to know lots and lots of people, like Johnny Saxon, Slim Pickens, Jerry Wallace, and yeah, Jane Burton. He was one of the nicest persons I ever met. Roger Miller, the country singer, yeah. very, very good friend of mine. While you're talking about the rock and roll trio, both those guys are good friends of mine. That's still one of the rarest records. Oh, yeah. It ain't, it's not the rarest, but it's one of the, I'd say in the top 20, and I always say that I could always fit in anywhere. I'm the only one I knew that could go to Watts back in the 50s when it was really, really a pretty rough place. I used to go out there looking for records and I'd go into this area all alone and never had no problem. I got along with everybody. And I think anybody could get along with anybody if man, they really wanted to. I think people try harder not to get along than they do to get along. You're being forced to close a store. How do you feel about that? Well, it's, it's, it, it's just something that happened. You know, it's nothing I had anything to do with. The city of San Jose condemned the property here. I think it is sort of a sad thing for um, for collectors and crate diggers around the uh, around the area. You know, people make make trips to the South Bay just to shop at Big Al's store. It is sad because it's it's an institution. You know, around here, he's run that shop like forever and he's always there and it's like a time warp going in there and it just sucks because all record stores, a lot of record stores are closing and that's one of the more unique spots. Plus he's got a parrot. I think it's going to be a sad to a lot of people that actually still shop there because he's got customers like myself and older that have been going to his store for years. There's just not a whole lot of places like Al so it's going to be sort of a Sort of a, a loss for the community. My wife said, why are you still buying records? You're going out of business. I said, I don't know. I, I just like records, that's all. And he's been doing it for so long. I, I think like to just sit there and not do anything would just feel too weird. I just never saved any money. I just, all I ever cared was turning over and buying more records. So the more money I got, the more money I spent. And there's a lot of times that people don't have enough money and I'll let them walk out of here owing me money. I've never known where I made deals like that where people didn't pay me. They always paid me. And, uh, and I just think that's part of business that makes you a good, a good store. And that's why my, word, my word's good. My father told me, if your word ain't no good, you ain't no good. Honestly, if he wanted to, he could have gave up a long time ago. But the fact of the matter is that he's been doing this 
for more than half his life. And considering the amount of health problems that he's had, he's still with it, which is a very admirable thing. And I respect the hell out of him for that. Who would have thought I'd ever even have made it this long? You know? <laughs> so what are you, you going to miss most when you finally close? Lock that door the last time. Talking to people. If they weren't going to tear down, I'm sure I'd stay here longer. <laughs> I'd probably stay here till I die. Otherwise, I just got to stay home and sit in a chair. And in here, I get to meet a lot of people, and I like to talk anyway, and it's sort of fun. I probably got as many friends in my life that I met through music as I met through other things. People just all know who I am. They all come over and ask me who did this song or who did that song. Or always some, something about music. What, what does music mean to you? Music is my life. When I don't feel good, I play it. When I feel good, I play it. And when I don't do anything, I play it. You know, I just play music all the time. Music is beautiful. It's, it's good for everybody. It's when times are good and times are bad, music soothes the soul. I don't know what it would be like without it. I just want to thank you again. Yeah, so. it was nice you coming in. Yeah. And for somebody to go in there, I'd say, say hello. You know, he's just a nice dude. It's just a cool place. There's, there's still gonna, be, there's always gonna be shops like Big Al's, but there's never gonna be one that is Big Al's. Big Al, uh, last of the old school. In the world of internet searches and free shipping, I feel like places like this are getting harder and harder to find, and I can't help but think that this is gonna be a cultural loss when Big Al's finally closes. Even if you don't collect vinyl, you owe it to yourself to come on down and say hi to Al. I know he'll love to talk to you. I'm your vinyl geek, and I'll catch you on the flip side. My grandkids all call me Big Al. I don't know why, I'm not that big. <laughs> <laughs>